Today we're back into the beginning in verse 14. That's where we're going to be. And believe it or not, Pentecost was a, a Jewish celebration before it was a Christian celebration. And so all these pilgrims from all over the place have flocked to worship in Jerusalem. And the early church is waiting in a room and they're praying because Jesus promised that he was going to send the Holy Spirit. He was going to send. So they're praying and they're waiting. And then all of a sudden there was this loud sound as of thunder and it shook the entire city. And so everybody's running out and they're trying to figure out what's going on. In the room as they're praying, the church opens their eyes and they see tongues as of fire over the heads of all of the people of God. God had descended and he was filling his church and he sent them out into the city and they opened their mouths to proclaim the glorious good news of, of what God had done. But as they spoke, the words came out in languages that they had never learned. And so here you have all these pilgrims from all over the place in the city, and they're rushing out to see the commotion, and they're hearing the glorious good news of the gospel proclaimed in their native tongue. And it was a confusing, confusing glorious scene. And in the midst of that, that massive crowd, the Apostle Peter stands up and he, and he addresses this whole congregation. And he says, let me tell you what it is that's happening here. Now, let, let me remind you, the Apostle Peter, just seven weeks prior, was the one who denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. This is the man who was cowering in fear as he watched the cost of following Jesus, as Jesus is being tried, as Jesus is beaten and bloody and about to be crucified. Peter sees the cost, and Peter denies Jesus three times. But here, in an assembly with thousands of people, Peter stands up and says, I have some news to share with you. That's the scene that we're jumping into here. And he opens his mouth and preaches a sermon that changed the world. Now, I suspect if you're here uh, that you've heard a number of sermons in your life, and there's probably one or two that you could point back to that were instrumental in your life. Is that true? I can think back right moments. So maybe you've heard of, of Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he preached this sermon about the, the judgment because of our sin that we are all going to face apart from Christ. He used this illustration of, of a spider dangling from its web over a volcano. And the only thing separating that spider from this destruction is this tiny little web which is disintegrating because of the heat. It's going to drop in a moment. And he looked out and he said, that's us. He says, we are, we are about to face the judgment of God and, and in an instant we could be dropped into this judgment. We must repent. He preached this and it changed America. It started a whole revival. And in every denomination, in every movement, they can point back to sermons that were instrumental in shaping the trajectory and charting a course. But before any of those sermons, there was this sermon. The sermon. The first Christian sermon ever preached by the New Testament church. And I say that acknowledging that Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, for example. But this is the first Christian sermon in that this is the first sermon that clearly explains and articulates what Jesus Christ accomplished in his life, death, and resurrection for us. This is the first Christian sermon preached by the New Testament church. It declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days, I will... And so Peter, he these questions in the, to, to catapult into this sermon, to draw them into what it is that they need. And I see you and you look confused. You're probably wondering, are these people drunk? Listen, it's 9 a.m. They're not drunk. But let me tell you just what this is. And then he invites them to lean in and he speaks. And he points them to the book of Joel, which remember, he's addressing a Jewish audience. So they, they know here with the book of Joel. So I want to give you a quick summary. You could really break the book of Joel into two messages, all right? Message one in the book of Joel is a message of judgment. There has just been a famine in the land. We're not entirely sure when this was written, but it was a time when there was famine. It was a time when the crops had been devoured by the locust. And as people do, they're looking at these circumstances and saying, wow, we've, we've had a run of bad luck. This is a really unfortunate. You know, this is how it goes. It's ups and downs, and we're in a down, and it's bad luck. And Joel leans in and says, this isn't bad luck. Saying this, you need to read. There's going to be locusts coming, only these locusts are riding on horses and they have swords. There's an army that's coming to judge us because of our sin, because we're living in wickedness. That was the message of Joel. This is bad news of judgment. That after the judgment, there was coming a new era, a new day, a glorious day, the last days. 
And those days would be marked by the presence of of God's gift of prophecy as they're filled with the Spirit. And that would be the mark of the new day. So for example, he says, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's what Joel's saying. There's judgment, but there's deliverance. And the deliverance, these days of of repentance and glory are going to be marked by the outpouring of the Spirit and the speaking of prophecy from all of the people. And what Peter's doing is he's saying, hey, this thing here, you thought it was drunkenness? It's not drunkenness. This is that, friends. He's saying, brothers and sisters, you read Joel and you're looking forward with anticipation and you're wondering what it is that Joel... Because there are no spectators in the church. This gracious opportunity for repentance that Joel looked forward to is upon us. And it's being extended to the world and it's being extended through the church. Therefore, we cannot be silent. If I could just share a personal story, the, um, at the lighthouse, I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with him um, just a month ago. And I remember, I do, I do this little Bible study on Friday mornings, it's poorly attended. Frequently, I'm just by myself. But sometimes I'll have one or two, and, and on this one day, this one man sat across the table, it's my first time speaking to him, and so I thought, I've never seen him before. Let's just talk about the gospel. And so for an hour, we talked. We went back and forth, and I shared with him the gospel. But in the middle of the meeting, and he takes his call, and he tells her, Mom, I, I can't talk to you. Is he receiving this? Is he not? He says, I'll see you on Sunday. We, he never came. And I went home just wondering, like, sometimes we wonder why we do this. He's throwing out the seed. Is anything, is, does any of this matter? He's just a young guy. I had no idea that that would be the only time I'd ever get a chance to share the gospel with him. I had no idea that he would have weeks left to get right with the Lord. We're in battle. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And Peter looks up and says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God raised. Our minds naturally gravitate to the miraculous signs, the thunder, the, the, the tongues of fire, the speaking of tongues. Jesus. You know, and, and this is the testimony of Scripture in the New Testament. Whenever there's these signs and wonders and whenever there's this confusion, it always gives way to clarity. In Corinth, you had this church and they got caught up with some of the signs that, that were really exciting and exhilarating to them, but the, the signs that they were so excited about were causing confusion. And, and Paul leaned in and said, the world can understand one word of prophecy that points people to Jesus, then a hundred words that leaves people confused. I recognize Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit directs our hearts and our minds and our eyes to Jesus. We couldn't see Him before. We're so busy looking at all this filth and junk and all this stuff, but the Holy Spirit just lifts our chin, directs us to Jesus, opens our eyes, gives us new life to see Him. And if you comes, whom I will send to you from the Father... The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about what? Me. He'll bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit came to see what it is that we should see. Al Mohler explains, this is a helpful quote, I think. Where you find the Spirit of God present, you do not find so much testimony about the Holy Spirit as you find a testimony about Christ. Where you find, therefore, a bold Biblical, urgent, accurate, enthusiastic, joyful, and life-changing testimony of Christ, you can rest assured that the Holy Spirit is vibrantly at work. And that's what we see here at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit vibrantly at work, animating Peter, who was a coward denying Christ, animating him to become a courageous, faith-filled man, proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And he looks out at this crowd and he says, this is... Jesus, these signs that you're seeing is preparing you to see Jesus. You heard Jesus. Or they'd be family or friends with people who heard Jesus. Peter says, you heard him. He taught as one with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. When Jesus spoke, it was like God was speaking. Because God was speaking. 
You saw the way he lived perfectly. You tried to pin things on him, but nothing ever stuck. He was the perfect man, the God man. You watched him do signs. That you... The mute came and their tongues were loose and they could speak. The dead were brought to life by Jesus. You saw him, friends. And then he says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. One old pastor notes in that statement, that verse, this was God's plan. Right? The, the, he knew what it would cost to redeem His people. God is sovereign over the cross. Nevertheless, He goes on to say, you did this. You crucified Him at the hands of lawless men. God sovereignly will spend a lifetime trying. It's this mystery. We could devote an entire sermon to this mystery. We won't, though, because that's not Peter's point. And it's to teach us that the cross isn't the end of the story. Peter wants us to understand that this man, Jesus, has conquered the grave. And he roots this announcement in another Old Testament passage that would have been familiar to his audience. He points them back to Psalm 16. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. And David wrote Psalm 16. And this was a perplexing psalm for the Jews. Because while David had accomplished many amazing feats in his lifetime, immortality wasn't one of them. Right? David died. That's what Peter says. He stands up and he says, listen, can I remind you? This David, he died. He's seen corruption. He's buried. You know where the tomb is. It's with us to this day. Therefore, Peter says, this psalm that you love, that you delight, is after you killed him at the hands of lawless men. Three days after, this Jesus who was so glorious, this Jesus that we rejected and we killed, three days later, he walked out of the tomb. And he broke the chains of death. And he proved that death no longer has a hold on the people of God. This Jesus has risen. That's our testimony. And he says, listen, you can ask me. I'm a witness. I've seen him. I've touched his hands. I ate a meal with him. I sat under his teaching. My life is never going to be the same. You can ask these 120 believers with me. It's an important announcement you're ever going to hear in your life, he says. And it leads to the resounding conclusion of Peter's sermon, where he declares... This Jesus, this King, is on his throne. Let's pick up at verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. So here he's bringing together all of the strands of this sermon. And he lands it on this grand conclusion that Christ is on his throne. He points them to another familiar passage, Psalm 110. And it's not surprising that Peter would use Psalm 110 because Peter heard Jesus preach from Psalm 110. So he knew exactly what this psalm meant. Jesus uses this in Matthew 22. I want to read it because Jesus explains it well here. Matthew 22, verses 41 to 45. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, so here Jesus is he's addressing their expectations. He's saying, what are you looking for when you look for the Messiah, the Christ? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord? Saying, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? So you see the point that Jesus is making here. He, they're saying the, the Christ, but there's a piece that you're missing. He is going to be a son of David, but he's going to be more. He's going to have to be more. And you know this because you've read Psalm 110. Let me just let me remind you what Psalm 110, see it. Jesus says, David, David wrote this and David is calling this coming Messiah. David's calling him Lord. Which means this is more than just a son of David. It's more. And so Peter here, he's bringing it all together. And he's saying, listen, friends, everything that you're witnessing testifies to the fact that Jesus 
is the king and that he's seated on his throne. The benefits of his reign are being poured out on us. We're in the last days, friends. Did you know that? We're living in the last days. Everything after the resurrection until his return. We're in the last days. And he says, I know this is true because Joel said it was coming. And Joel said that when it comes, it will be evidenced by the outpouring of the Spirit of God. He says, that happened. You've seen it. That has happened already. And and the resurrection from Psalm 16 that we've been waiting for, that when you reject it. Matthew 27, verse 25. You can make a little note if you're a note taker. Matthew 27, 25. Remember what the Jews said? Pilate, I see no guilt in this man. The Jews said, may his blood be on us and on our children. So they're saying, oh, you think he's an innocent man? We're going to take the guilt of this. Let let his blood be on us. Let it be on our children. This is the kind of sermon that demands a response. Unsurprisingly, in the very next verse, we see this response from those who are listening to him. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? It's a very good question. You know, they were feeling rightfully the weightiness of this announcement, the guilt associated with this announcement, the urgency. They were cut to the heart. And I hope that you understand today that we are just as guilty as these first listeners. We're not, we're not reading a story about, oh, here's, here's how these Jewish people are actions. And Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I am an all and so are you. And so were they. We've rejected the king. Rejected his authority. Every time that we sin, every time that we act in in disobedience to him, we are rejecting him as Lord. We're sinners. Sinners who sin. We hurt people. We say things. Say things that people can never forget for their life. You know, we've left wounds and scars on people that we'll never even understand. We've done things. We've not done things. We rob God of glory. We give the glory that He deserves to lesser things. We thumb our noses at Him. Sometimes we do it knowingly. We insult Him. We mock Him. We use His name as a curse word. We we are sinners. We sing the words, it was listeners were asking the right question. It's the same one that we should be asking. Brothers, it's for you. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. His reign and his authority. Are you guilty for the crucifixion of the King of kings and the Lord of lords? What shall we do? Peter couldn't be clearer. You don't need to jump through a bunch of hoops. You don't need to try to earn this love. You don't need to try to wash yourself clean. He says, you gotta, here's three things. Repent. Repentance. What is it? Repentance lays aside all the excuses. Repentance tells the truth. Repentance says those words into actions. Repentance doesn't simply, and it's only made possible by the Spirit of God. You see, you can't simply muster up repentance, can you? Because in our flesh and according to our desires, to repent is to acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord of my life. And in our help of the Holy Spirit, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. Robert Murray McShane writes, the first, so you know that Maybe you're here and you're like, is the, is the Spirit working in me? If He is beginning to open your eyes to see that you are a sinner and to feel that, that your life actually belongs to God and that you've been mis if you're feeling that, that is the work of the Spirit of love. Although a dove is His emblem, although He be compared to the soft wind and gentle dew, still His first work is to convince of sin. Where there's conviction of sin, you can rest assured that the Holy Spirit is working. The alternate is true as well. Where there's no conviction of sin, you can rest assured that it's not the Spirit that's working. And in our evangelism, we see this at times, don't we? Maybe you've seen this in your own life. You know, we come to Jesus because we want Him to do things for us. We come to Jesus because we we want Him to make life better. We come to Jesus because we want the bread. Remember Jesus, this crowd came to Him and He says, you're coming here because you want more bread. You don't understand what I've come to do. 
And that happens still today. People come, I, I want to feel better about myself. I want to feel better about my family. I want to be a better wife, a better husband, a better mother. Maybe Jesus can, can give me these things that I need. But, but when the Holy Spirit is really working, what he does is he opens your eyes to see the sin. And so if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, but, but you're not grieved by the sin. You know, listen, none of us is perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But if the Spirit is in us, then we are grieved by it. And we're day by day letting these things go. And if you've got this overt sin in your life, and you're like, I love this. I love you too, Jesus, and I love this. There's no work of the Spirit there. Repent. <laughs> Repent. And then, step two, be baptized. 3,000 Jews were baptized in the name of Jesus on Pentecost. And you know, we... That's amazing. Uh, even if we don't put it in its right perspective, that's amazing. 3,000 people baptized. If 3,000 people were baptized here in Aurelia today, that'd be amazing, right? We'd, we'd be shocked by it. But this is even more shocking still. So one great commentator, Richard Longnecker, I'm going to read a long quote because I think it's helpful. We want to wrap our heads around something that's removed from us. The Jews generally looked on baptism as a rite only for Gentile, that is non-Jewish converts, proselytes. Not for one born a Jew. It symbolized the break with one's Gentile past and the washing away of all defilement. So when Jews accepted baptism in the name of Jesus on hearing Peter's message, it was traumatic and significant for them in a way that we in our mildly Christianized culture have difficulty understanding. In other words, for, for these Jewish people, baptism was something that the non-Jewish people, like, oh, hey, you, you Greek, hey, you Roman, if you want to come and worship our God, you need to be baptized to wash you from all of your uncleanness, then you can come into the community of faith. But here what we have are 3,000 Jewish people saying, I'm the unclean one, and I need to be washed in Jesus' name so that I can come into the community of faith. This was shocking. It was a big deal. It was public. There were no private pools in this day. This wasn't, they didn't go back to a private pool party and two of them baptized. No, they would have had to go to the public baths in Jerusalem. They, there would have been hostile witnesses watching. I mean, so you imagine if we held our baptism at the, the rec center during the public swim, right? Now, they're not even hostile. They're confused, probably. But, boy, there probably wouldn't be as long of a lineup for baptism, right? Because that's, it's public, all these people are watching, and that's what's happening here. They're going down to the public baths in Jerusalem, and they're baptizing these folks. It's public. It's also costly. They weren't just, it's not like they were kind of walking into a thing of water and just dip myself and then pop back out. They were walking out into the water with this crowd of witnesses to one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Can I remind you, seven weeks ago in this same city, Jesus was crucified. Can I remind you that crowds of people were cheering and spitting at him and mocking him seven weeks ago in this same city? Some of those people are here in this public bath. I don't know. All these people are watching. The word's going to get out. They're walking over to one of the disciples of Jesus, and then they're being baptized. This thing that was reserved for Gentiles, they're being baptized in the name of Jesus, the one who was crucified here seven weeks ago. Boy, this cost them everything. They're, they're walking into the water. They're probably wondering, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my family? Am I going to lose my life? And when we were in India, we visited the Golden Temple, which is, uh, it's kind of like what the Vatican is to Catholics, the Golden Temple is to Sikhs. And it's, it's this beautiful place, you know, just humanly speaking, beautiful, golden, it's a golden temple. I didn't know what to expect. I should have. A temple of gold. Um, and, but you walk into this, um, huge court, and you get in, and they've got, they're using those, I'm not, some kind of trumpet, and there's guards, and they've got their swords, because they've got, that's part of their faith, is they, they're wearing these big swords, and it's, it's quiet and somber, and there's this huge man-made lake, and at the center of the lake is this golden temple shining in the sun, and there's a little path that leads out to it. And in this golden, or not the golden lake, in this lake, pilgrims who have traveled here, they, they come down into the lake and they immerse themselves into the water to cleanse them from their sins. Can you imagine if they're in the golden temple 
I open my mouth and I preach the good news of Jesus Christ, whose blood is the only thing that has the power to wash us of our sins. Jesus, who is King and Lord. Jesus, who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Imagine I'm preaching this sermon, and then 3,000 Sikhs are converted to Christ, and I baptize them there in this public lake, there outside the Golden Temple. Can you imagine? That would be shocking and, and costly and public. And What we're seeing, however, here in Acts 2 is very similar. Like if you can wrap your mind around it, this is a big deal. Baptism is public. It is costly. It is an outward expression of an inward possession of faith. I want you to notice that the people who were baptized are those who received the word. That's in verse 41. Those who received his word were baptized. Now, we as a church, we're very open-handed in terms of the debates around, do you baptize infants? Do you baptize believers? We have deep respect for people on both sides. We love them deeply. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're convictionally, however, a Baptist church. We baptize believers, and verse 41 is one of the reasons why. Those who received his word, those who understood the call and the cost, and who said, I'm in, were baptized. They chose to be. They went into the water, and in doing so, they were declaring, I am a sinner who sins. I am guilty, but the Holy Spirit has enabled me to see that Jesus has died as my substitute. He's cleansed me from my sin. He is risen from the dead. He's promised to deliver me from the dead. I believe him. So his death is my death. His resurrection is my resurrection. I'm taking up my cross and I am following him wherever he leads, no matter the cost. Come hell or high water. Come persecution or abandonment. Come suffering or death. It doesn't matter because Jesus Christ is the king. And I'm with him. That's what baptism means. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what Jesus called us to do. Pentecost was the birthday of the New Testament church. And here on day one, the church is obeying Jesus' great commission. Go therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. See, baptism is the front door of the community of faith. Step one of Christian discipleship. The place where faith goes public. So let me ask you before we move on. Have you gone public with your faith? Repent. Be baptized. And Peter concludes, receive the gift of the Spirit. Receive. The, it's not something you do. He doesn't say take the gift. Receive. It needs to be given to you. And I want to be clear here that this, this is all happening. He says, this baptism and this receiving, it's all happening simultaneously. If you look back at the verse, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every true believer, everyone who has bowed their knee to Jesus Christ, has received the gift of the Spirit. Galatians 4.6 says, Because you are sons or daughters, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We have the Spirit. And because we have the Spirit, it's going to be evidenced by the fact that suddenly our affections change. You know, you can't change your affection on your own, can you? That's why we go back to these patterns of sin. Because we love them. People do what they love. Maybe you're here today and you've been bound by addictions. There's things in your life, things in your marriage, things in your parenting that just you want them to change, but they won't change. You know why they won't change? Because your loves are in the wrong order. You can't change your affections, but you know who can? The Holy Spirit. And he's been given to every believer. Every son or daughter of the king has received the Holy Spirit. He opens our eyes to see sin that we didn't even see before. I was repenting last night of this sin that I see in my life. And I was, at, at one point I chuckled a little bit because I thought, 10 years ago, man, the things I was repenting of 10 years ago, I would have never even dreamed. I didn't even think these things were sin. I'm, I'm lying there, I'm repenting of overeating the chips. I was. And I just thought, this is just, I can't even, I don't even have the ability to see these things that, that, that are sin apart from the help of the Holy Spirit. But that's what he does. From one degree of glory to the next, he changes us. And maybe you're here today, and you've just been stagnant. And there's no growth. There's no change. 
and, and you just feel like something is off in your life. You feel like there's this, what's the word? I don't, this, this brokenness, you can't quite put your finger on it. This like dissonance, you know, it's like a chord where it's got the bad note. There's this dissonance that won't resolve in your life. You can't see what it is. Something's wrong. I'm not sure what it is. A longing's there. I can't satisfy it. A dread's there. I can't put my finger on it. Listen, 3,000 people on Pentecost were feeling that same feeling. These 3,000 people, can I remind you, are in Jerusalem to worship God. 3,000 people who are living in accordance with their worldview, with their understanding of the world. These are, these are good people doing the good things. Living life right. And yet, as they hear the proclamation of Jesus, as they hear about the King that they have not bowed their knee to, as they hear about the man who conquered death, as they hear about their sin, even though these good people are doing the good things and living the life as they thought that they should, in that moment, all of a sudden, the dissonance just was unbearable. Something is wrong. What do I do? Maybe you're here today and you're just in the same place. Something is wrong. I'm doing all the things that I thought I was supposed to do, but I'm looking at my family, I'm looking at the world, and I'm feeling that there's something deeply wrong. What do I do? Brothers, what must we do? Repent. Be baptized. And receive his spirit. This is a call to a public faith. A costly faith. It is going to cost you everything. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. It's a call to a transforming faith. It's going to change your life. You're putting something else, you're recognizing something else as being the center of your life. It's a call to the life that you were made to enjoy forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, my mind goes back to that meeting a month ago. And I just feel a great sense of urgency and I, I just plead with you. I plead with you that if there is anyone here today who is dead in their sin, who has convinced themselves that they have more time, who has convinced themselves that they can live with this, I can, I can carry on my way. I pray in Jesus' name that right now, by the power of your spirit, you would bring dead bones to life. I pray that eyes would open. I pray that hearts would soften. I plead with you, God, only you can do it. I cannot preach that sermon. I couldn't preach it a month ago. I can't preach it now. But Lord, you love these people. And if there's anyone here who is going to leave this place still condemned in their sin, hanging by a thread over eternal judgment. I just plead with you in Jesus' name that you would open their eyes today. God, please. And if there are people here who, who have convinced themselves that they're followers of Jesus, just like those good religious people who were gathered there on Pentecost to follow through with their good religious services, but Jesus was never Lord of their life. Maybe there are people like that today. God, would you open their eyes to see you see their need, see that, that when the Holy Spirit comes into a person, comes into a man, comes into a woman, he changes their affections. He puts Christ at the center. He makes all of the other lesser things fall to the floor. All of the idols crumble when the Holy Spirit comes in. Lord, if there are people here today who are walking in the shallow name of Jesus without without the authority and the power and the transformation that is supposed to be there. I pray that you would today open their eyes to see that they need Jesus. Let there be repentance and renewal. Lord, I pray, I thank you for the baptisms that are happening up the road at Countryside, and I pray for many more baptisms here. And Lord, I pray that they would be public, that they would be costly, that they would be filled with faith. And Lord, that you would raise up disciples here in our midst, 
to go into the world and to proclaim this glorious news. Thank you for this news. It's good news, God. It's the greatest news. It's the news that we were created to delight in and to share, God. So help us. Lord, I pray that you would help us like Peter to transform from the the cowards that we can be to the courageous ambassadors of Christ that you've made us to be. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Worship team, would you lead us?